Hey everybody, what's going on? Dace here, and today we're having a casual chat about a masterpiece shmup and one of my all-time favorites, Devil Engine. With the recent release of Ignition, I figured there would likely be a bunch of people jumping into the game for the first time or revisiting things after a few years. This felt like an excellent opportunity to share some tips and lessons with others and talk a little about how I viewed the game two years ago compared to now, as recent observations can help demystify the strong reputation that may have kept many players at bay. Near the end of this video, I will also include an often missed visual detail that demonstrates the masterful presentation riddled throughout the entirety of the journey. So with that out of the way, let's get right into things. Devil Engine is known for being super memorization heavy, and I feel this is a huge part of what intimidates some people when they think about jumping in to tackle a 1cc. My original idea was to do a short Devil Engine tips video, but when I started recording gameplay, I noticed that I was cruising along just fine even though I didn't remember any of my routing. This observation inspired me to reevaluate my stance on the game and explore whether Devil Engine is as memorization heavy as I've always told myself, or if some other factor can unhinge that thought and further empower me as a player. To begin exploring this, I've recorded a few stages and compared my gameplay from two years ago to footage of me jumping in again for the first time since then. I quickly discovered that the acclimation process, which I'll talk more about in an upcoming Coffee and Shmups video, was once again playing a significant role even though it operates as a background process. In a nutshell, the acclimation process is what I call the adjustment phase that comes with gaining more experience in a game and allows us to operate more freely within the environment without relying as much on things like memorization. This process cannot be forced, nor should it be. It unfolds naturally and will be experienced differently from one player to the next. Like if you were to move somewhere unfamiliar, your first few weeks or months would probably feel clunky with not knowing where things are or how to navigate the area. However, after a more extended period, you'd eventually establish an awareness without even meaning to, and interacting within this place would require less of your mental resources because of this development. That said, if you're playing the game for the first time, you'll likely memorize more because you haven't immersed yourself in the environment enough or adjusted to the point where you can loosen your grip, so to speak. Furthermore, a foundation of memorization is still important for the bosses, since these encounters are condensed high-threat experiences requiring careful planning and execution. But even there, I still found that on my first attempt after so long I could still no-miss the Stage 2 boss, which can get pretty hectic at times. Either way, I feel Devil Engine's demands concerning memorization are lower than I continued to believe up until now. It doesn't mean a more free-flowing run will look as tightly executed or resource-efficient as one might appear when broken down to an absolute science, but the ability to accomplish something with a more fluid approach as opposed to requiring a strict process reveals that the game may be more intimidating than it actually is, carefully concealing flexibility we don't realize exists. Let's simultaneously compare the first half of Stage 3 from my clear two years ago with the same stage portion when I booted up the other night. In the past, Stage 3 initially claimed many lives until I buckled down and devised a precise step-by-step -step method for dealing with or avoiding enemies. At the time, I felt this was the only way for me to make it through Stage 3's pressurized opening reliably. In the upper screen, you'll see me using specific timing to go from one position to the next to dance around enemies as they filter onto the screen. Other times, I'll wait at a precise point to lure the mechanical snake's attack from the background to the foreground and weave this into the overall positional sequencing. It took a fair amount of trial and error to formulate this route. I feel it was a mix of being less experienced than I am now, and also the ideas I held surrounding Devil Engine's difficulty. In contrast, the bottom screen's performance from the other day is completely reaction-based playing. There is no method, organization, or resource efficiency yet it shows how much my experience within the environment comes to the forefront and allows me to function well enough without a game plan. I'm not saying I wouldn't put the time into learning the flow if I were to do the entire run again, because I love doing that, but this shows two very different experiences, the latter of which reveals that memorization is not as much of a requirement as I've maintained these last couple of years, even though flailing about unaware is not my preferred approach. It simply serves as an interesting example, and the same observations were made from the other stage comparisons I tested. Next, let's get into some tips for those jumping in for the first time or who never really got deep into the game when it first came out. To keep this video shorter, I've decided not to include an explanation of the mechanics. If you have any specific questions about how things function, please leave them in the comments. Unlike many shmups, the bombs in Devil Engine do not offer you a screen-clearing effect, but act more like a special attack. While I used the odd bomb here and there during the stage portion of certain stages, I never really felt they were necessary for making it to each boss, even in my more inexperienced state. 
the boss encounters are where the bombs play a much more crucial role. It's not that you can't learn the patterns and reduce how many are used, because you totally can. But due to the fast and furious intensity of the boss fights, you'll most likely want to spam more than a few to bring these opponents down quickly. If you don't, there is a much higher risk of losing one life after another since the game can easily chain death you if you're not careful. Remember that you get a bomb for every 5,000 points scored and an extra life for every 50,000 points. So one life is equivalent to 10 bombs, and while you don't want to waste them, it's much better to burn through a small handful that you can sooner replenish instead of losing a life which takes much more scoring to get back. The next tip is getting a feel for how to lean into bullet clouds while bursting. In many games we instinctively move away from enemy projectiles because it allows more time and space to decide the best movement, or because we don't have a mechanic for directly interacting with these threats. However, Devil Engine's burst mechanic allows us to work with what's on the screen in ways that can greatly benefit us and maintain greater screen control. If you haven't already started leaning into bullet clouds when absorbing, I encourage you to experiment with this idea. By slightly nudging yourself forward while bursting you absorb more bullets, reducing more threats, increasing your score, and pushing yourself closer to getting the next bomb or life sooner. Here's a brief example. If you're familiar with the burst mechanic's additional ability to split weapon icons or change it to the weapon type you currently hold, you'll know that bursting the icon will send it shooting forward a short distance before it begins drifting back again. Doing this can present a few issues that can quickly make matters worse. For instance, if the screen is filled with enemy projectiles, there's a high risk of pushing the changed weapon icon into a cloud of bullets. In turn, this often makes it so that you must burst again to clear a path to the desired icon. But with the weapon icon drifting back, you risk unintentionally switching it again when you burst, further complicating your situation and rapidly burning your combo meter down to nothing, which leaves you in the most vulnerable state. So what I do is burst while in front of the weapon icon. This is mostly when you want to power up the weapon you already have, or at least snag the extra 500 points while simultaneously eliminating threats if your power level is already maxed. When bursting from in front, the icon will still move forward, which means it launches directly into your ship instead of into danger zones. This won't necessarily be the most game-changing tip for everyone, but I implement it thoroughly as it contributes to tighter feeling performance and a cleaner screen. Let's look at some brief examples that have been slowed down. In the unsafe method, we see how bouncing the weapon icon forward and away from you in situations like this is the first step toward a less than favorable setup, where obtaining the icon becomes more complicated and dangerous. In the safe method, we can see the benefit of bursting in front of the weapon icon as this instantaneously nets us the desired item without complication. In many situations, we'll also create more breathing room by clearing enemy projectiles closer to the middle of the screen while bursting in front of a weapon icon instead of doing so near the far left, which would leave us little to no room to retreat if necessary. These considerations directly relate to cleaner performance and tighter control of on-screen threats. My final tip for this video is to exercise extreme caution if using the analog stick on the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller. I used this when I cleared very hard mode two years ago, and when I watch over the footage it's insane seeing how the movement looks. I remember making it to the final boss with 10 lives. With not having practiced much at all and with the wonky movement of the controller stick especially, it was one death after another until I was one hit away from losing the run. It's really easy to spot the lives lost from overshooting with the analog, especially when you have your ship's speed set to maximum, so definitely be careful if you're using the same input method for your movement. That said, all the recently recorded gameplay captured for this video was done using the D-pad instead, which is always my go-to when I'm not using an actual arcade stick. I'm certain the final fight would have been much cleaner had I used it previously. But of course, use whatever you feel suits you best, as there's no right or wrong way to control a game as long as you're not suffering because of it. That wraps up the tips for now, so let's finish things off with the easy-to-miss visual details I mentioned at the start of the video. If you keep your eyes peeled on the background during stage 4 just before reaching the boss, you'll see a mysterious object zigzagging from one ship to another before they all suddenly begin exploding. This is an incredibly cool detail that amplifies the stellar experience and presentation. To go from thinking I had to memorize every square inch of the game two years ago, to feeling more than comfortable and adequately equipped to deal with whatever the game throws at me without much memorization is an exciting development. Now when I play, I feel as though I'm a greater part of the environment itself as opposed to a visitor struggling against it. 
It reveals how much I have grown as a player within Devil Engine specifically and the genre as a whole. And without having jumped back in, I might not have realized these strides of improvement or experienced this shift of perspective regarding Devil Engine's ironclad reputation. Anyway, that brings this video to a close. I trust it has helped shed greater light on the behemoth that is Devil Engine, and perhaps you'll even revisit other games and surprise yourself when you see how far you've come. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate the support and we'll see you all soon. Take care.